Hello everyone and welcome to uh, this uh, Social Europe videocast. My name is Robin Wilson, uh, the editor of Social Europe. And with me today, I have uh, Patrick Diamond, who is a reader in public policy at the Queen, University, Queen Mary University of London, um, and also fulfilled a number of roles in the Labour governments in Britain prior to 2010, including in uh, number 10 Downing Street. And uh, Patrick's going to talk to me today um, about the British Labour Party in the context of the project which we are conducting, which is being supported by the um, Founda Foundation for European Progressive Studies and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung on the challenges facing social democracy in this decade. Patrick, you're very welcome. Very good to be with you, Robin. But I want to start with Brexit. Um, it's hard to avoid starting any conversation about uh, politics in Britain without starting with Brexit. But I wanted to start with it specifically in terms of where the Labour Party stands vis-a-vis -vis the wider European social democratic family. The prevailing view on Labour has been simply to accept Brexit as a fait accompli. Uh, but I wanted to ask you how you could see relationships between Labour and the wider social democratic family in Europe developing over the years in that context, given that even in the past, they weren't always very close. Yeah, I think that's true. And obviously the history of Labour's contact with other European social democratic parties is one in which there have been periods of closeness and contact and influence. Um, but more often there has been, I think, some distance between the British Labour Party and the continental European centre-left parties. Where we stand today is that there are these two quite different processes underway. I think one relates, as you say, to the Labour Party's policy position on the question of Brexit, whether the Brexit settlement that the Conservative government under Boris Johnson has negotiated is sustainable and what Labour should say about that at the next general election. And then I think there's another quite separate process, which is about the contacts that take place between British Labour and other national social democratic parties across Europe. Um, of course, while we might suggest that those are separate, they're also intimately connected because if Labour's stance on Brexit is one in which it is nervous and afraid of talking about the European question, then that makes it perhaps less likely that it will have constructive links with its sister parties across Europe. And I think that is the situation that we're currently in. So the Labour Party is, I think, very worried about the European issue. It fears that if it talks too much about Europe, it will alienate a crucial element of its working class electoral constituency. And so the general mood in the party is to say as little about Europe as possible. And of course, that means that constructive contact and dialogue with other centre-left parties in Europe is much more difficult. And I think, unfortunately, that's the position that British Labour is now in. I'll just say one final thing, which is that I think the reason why it's so unfortunate is because... Labour has, of course, in the last 12 years experienced four consecutive general election defeats. And I think people on the left and right of the party would agree that it needs to fundamentally rethink its position. It needs to rethink its ideas, its programmes, its strategy, its message. And I think the evidence from history is that that is done well, um, in part by having good contact with other centre-left parties who provide constructive influences and ideas and intellectual stimulus. So from my perspective, if Labour wants to get its act together and be back in an election winning position, then it needs to have that contact with the centre left in Europe, which at the moment it frankly doesn't have enough. Well, one aspect of that wider debate, um, uh, Patrick, in Europe about the future of social democracy touches on the uh, very issue you mentioned there, which was uh, the concern within Labour about um, its working class support and the degree to which it seemed to be eroded by Brexit in the seats in Northern England that have been described as the so-called red wall seats. Uh, now elsewhere in Europe, there's been a, a whole debate about that, um, where, uh, for example, uh, Thomas Piketty has argued that we've seen the emergence of a Brahmin left of uh, uh, parties which appeal to university educated uh, supporters and seem unable to sustain uh, the support they traditionally drew, uh, particularly from the manual working class. And he would argue that what needs to be done about that is to push a more egalitarian agenda, uh, 
Others might take the view, um, which is to say, well, now look at what um, uh, was done by Schultz in Germany in the elections with his idea of cultural recognition, the so-called respect agenda. And so that would be an example of what you're talking about, where other parties are involved in discussions about how social democracy mark- can revive, um, and it's a European-wide debate rather than um, a purely British one. Supposing that Brit- the Labour Party in Britain was more part of that debate, how do you think that would change the discussion about the red wall seats? Because I think it is important to stress to people outside of Britain that that has been a really um, existential concern uh, in Labour, how on earth they get back that support that they've lost in uh, the north of England amongst people from a working class background. So what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's important to say maybe in background that the question of the red wall seats um, suggests that the relationship between Labour and its working class support is somehow a new problem. But of course, any cursory glance at history would show that Labour's always had a deeply contested relationship with its working class uh, constituency, and that continues to this day. I mean, there have always been a significant number of working class voters in Britain who've supported the Conservatives for you know, a variety of reasons that we could go into, but I think, in a sense, underlines why politics can be as much about culture as it can be about economics and class. Um, but for all those reasons, you know, the, the issue of Labour and its working class support is by no means a new one. And I think there's been a lively debate underway, really since the late 1950s, among different social democratic parties across Europe, in Sweden, in Germany, and Britain in particular, about what changes in the class composition of advanced industrial societies means for social democratic parties. To me, this whole controversy around the Red Wall is just another iteration of that debate, um, and it underlines the ways in which you cannot, as a social democratic party, take any element of your electoral constituency for granted. Um, I think where Labour goes from here, as you imply, um, is a question that should be addressed in in a European context. And I think Um, British Labour has been uh, interested in the way that um, Olaf Schultz approached the election in Germany. And as you were saying, the kind of discourse, the rhetoric that he was developing around the importance of respect, respect for those who do manual jobs, as well as for those who do middle class jobs and have a university education. So there's definitely an element to this, which is about finding the right language. But also, of course, you have to find the right policies. And that comes down to questions about redistribution, about how to make the labour market more egalitarian, about how to deal with some of the challenges around housing, um, education, the future of industry. So um, I think all of these points just underline why the dialogue between the British party and other parties in Europe is so important. You give a double answer to my first question. I want to come back to the first uh, component of it, um, Patrick which was uh, um, you were um, talking about whether the Brexit uh, settlement that has been uh, achieved in Britain, the so-called hard Brexit that has been pursued by Boris Johnson and his colleagues, um, is actually sustainable in the long run and whether by implication Labour should support it. Obviously, an argument against that would be that there's been a major um, economic hit uh, to, 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 to Britain uh, because of Brexit, as was anticipated by those who argued against it in the first instance. But even just to take today's agenda, for example, the Climate Change Committee um, in Britain has uh, given a very negative um, audit of the performance of Britain on its climate change commitments so far. And it seems difficult from the outside to see how on earth you can really address climate change seriously on a purely national basis, given it's a global concern. And it seems hard to see how you can be serious about climate change, in other words, unless you're part of something like the European Union, uh, which can address it on the transnational basis. Um, but, but is that debate possible in, in, in Labour, or is there still this, this, is this fear still so strong if we start talking about it, as you say, then we don't know where it's going to lead? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think that there is some space within Labour for acknowledging that some of the big policy issues of our time do need to be addressed through transnational uh, channels. 
Uh, climate change is one of those. I think the other relates to the security situation in Europe, not least because of the um, crisis over Ukraine and the obvious implications, the security of the current actions of the regime in Russia. Um, I think where there is more, in a sense, confusion in British Labour circles is around what to do about the economic dimensions of the European project. Because, of course, the current government, as you implied, has gone for a hard Brexit approach of pursuing match, maximum regulatory divergence from the EU on the basis that this will maximise the competitiveness of the British economy, because in an area like financial services, uh, you would be able to break with the kinds of rules and regulations that would be used by European financial centres and offer the world a kind of cut price financial services offer that at least some politicians on the right would think would generate growth and prosperity and so on. Now, I think that, that even that approach is being exposed as illusory. But of course, what is also happening is that the consequences of the friction to trade um, of being outside the European single market are becoming more evident every day. And I mean, you may also be aware that the current government is pursuing a so-called levelling up agenda, which is about trying to reduce regional inequality and make the north of England, uh, where these red wall seats are concentrated, um, perform better economically and gradually level up performance across the national economy. But in fact, all the evidence is that what Brexit has done is make London and the South East pull away even harder from the rest of the country. And so I think sooner or later, there is going to have to be a major national reevaluation of the whole purpose and impact of the Brexit project. But it may well be that we are not we have not reached that point yet, that, that in a sense, things will have to get worse before they can get better. Um, but Labour has to decide whether it wants to lead that debate or follow that debate. And I think for reasons not least to do with electoral concerns, at the moment, it looks like it's more in the mood to follow than to lead. Well, speaking of electoral um, concerns, um, Patrick, um, obviously there um, are some serious electoral concerns for the current government of Westminster in light of the two recent by-elections um, in England. One in a more middle-class uh, constituency in the southwest, which fell to the Liberal Democrats, and the other in the north of England, a more working-class seat, um, which fell to Labour. And um, in both cases, um, there was very heavy tactical voting under the first-past-the-post British electoral system um, in favour of the winning candidate. Um, and in the, in the aftermath of that, uh, Andy Burnham, the um, uh, uh, one of the leading figures in the Labour Party in the north of England, uh, said, look, we need to talk about proportional representation. Is it possible, given that the British system is so much of an outlier in Europe, Patrick, is it possible to have that debate seriously now, rather than the old view still prevailing in Labour that um, we've got to take over the commanding heights of the economy and we need one commanding party to do it? Yeah, well, I think that in a sense, the experience of the Labour government between 1997 and 2010 is very, very salutary in this regard, because, of course, as you know, um, although electoral reform was considered by that government and there was the Jenkins Commission in 1998, which looked at the question of an alternative electoral system for UK wide elections. Um, in the end, the Labour government decided to abandon any reform of elections to the House of Commons and to stick with the current first past the post system. And I think many, well, some historians will conclude, rightly in my view, that that was a major missed opportunity, because if a PR system for the House of Commons had been introduced, then that could have had all sorts of beneficial implications for the whole culture of how politics is conducted in Britain. Um, but of course, the opportunity wasn't taken, the rest is history. And um, we are where we are. I think it is interesting. You mentioned Andy Burnham um, making clear his position on proportional representation. And it's also very striking that some of the major trade unions, who of course are affiliated to the Labour Party, are also changing their position. So Unison, which is the big public sector union, has now voted in favour of proportional representation as a policy. Similarly, Unite, which is one of the bigger industrial unions, is also, I think, um, it's certainly possible it will change its position. So in some ways, similar to what happened in the 1980s and early 1990s, the, the centre-left in Britain is being forced by events to rethink its position, 
on whether, as you say, the route, the, the correct route to power is to go for absolute majorities in the House of Commons, but only to be in power sporadically, or whether to seek a more pluralist coalition building approach. And the latter is becoming definitely more in favour. But of course, as I think you inferred, it does challenge some of the basic culture of the Labour movement, because the Labour movement is all about gaining power on behalf of the Labour Party as a majoritarian entity. And so the idea of sharing power with other parties, whether it's the Liberal Democrats or the Greens or indeed other political movements, is one that does raise a lot of questions for people in Labour. But I think that there is a sense that um, the culture is changing. Events, Brexit, the executive power hoarding nature of the Johnson administration, the threat that it's posed to the constitution of the UK and some of the basic civilities of politics means that I think some major rethinking is underway and there is a chance now for Labour to adopt perhaps a new position on PR, which would put it more in line with the other major European democracies. Well, you mentioned, uh, uh, Patrick, the uh, uh, threats to the UK constitution and, and um, of course, um, um, the leader of the Scottish government and of the Scottish National Party um, has uh, repeated uh, the call for um, a further referendum on Scottish independence following the narrowly defeated referendum um, of 2014. And um, a Labour itself has lost um, much of its, most of its traditional support in Scotland, which at one time was very strong. Uh, including quite a bit, apparently, to the Scottish National Party. Um, and again, some would say that that requires Labour to rethink constitutional reform more generally, um, including uh, the possibility of a move towards a written constitution which would make for a federal UK, um, which might uh, uh, be enough to satisfy concerns for uh, autonomy in Scotland and might be an alternative way to address some of the alienation in Northern England that's expressed itself through English nationalism. Is that, do you think, something that is can be talked about or, or is that going to be dismissed as something that would only be of interest to the so-called chattering classes? I think that there is discussion underway about two dimensions of this debate. One is to do with, as you say, Scotland and the prospect of Scottish independence uh, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, announced this week that there would be an advisory referendum in September 2023. So this is going to be a very live issue in the forthcoming period. And I think alongside the question of Scottish independence is also the very important question about the governance of England, which, of course, the devolution settlement of the late 1990s introduced by the then Labour government didn't really address, as you'll recall there was devolution to institutions in Wales and Scotland, and of course, also in a different way in Northern Ireland. Um, there was some discussion about regional government in England, and there was a referendum in 2004 on whether to create an elected assembly for the North East, which of course failed. But beyond failed that, partly. the government of the time... Sorry to interrupt you, Patrick, but just for a, a, no. the perspective of our viewers, it failed partly because yeah. the devolution plan for the northeast of England was opposed by one Dominic Cummings, who was one of the prime campaigners against devolution, <laughs> and who, of course, went on to become one of the prime campaigners for Brexit. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's an excellent point. And um, as you say, Dominic Cummings ran the campaign against the Assembly on the basis that more government institutions will waste taxpayers' money and won't deliver any um, positive outcomes for voters in, in the northeast of England. And he certainly, I think, learned how to run an effective campaign in, in that referendum in 2004 and no doubt applied some of the lessons to the Brexit referendum in 2016. And there was some crossover in, in the themes between those campaigns. I think the other problem was that the model of regional devolution for England that Labour was pursuing at the time was in many ways a very limited one. The devolution of powers would not have been very significant. They certainly wouldn't have involved any thoroughgoing decentralisation of fiscal power, for example. And so many voters took one look at it and said, well, it's just not really, it's not radical enough to be worth um, the resources and, and the effort that would be required to really establish the new institution successfully. And so it was rejected. But my point here is that I think on your question about the direction that Labour takes on constitutional reform and the question of a federal Britain, it does need to rethink uh, 
um, both in terms of giving more fiscal and policy making power to Scotland. Um, it needs to accompany that with thinking about what to do in England. And um, I think the case for a major decentralisation of power is very compelling. But again, just as Labour finds it culturally difficult to envisage sharing power with other political parties, there is also, as you know, a very strong centralist mindset. And some of the strongest opponents of devolution in the UK historically have come from within the British Labour Party. So there is also a need for a major rethink there. I sense that things are moving, but there is still some way to go. It's also just worth saying, finally, that Gordon Brown has been tasked by the current leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, um, with coming up with a new constitutional blueprint. He's running a constitutional commission to look in particular at this question of whether there should be a federal Britain. And um, I think that commission will report sometime next year. OK, Patrick. Well, thanks uh, very much for that uh... Whistle stop tour of the very many issues which uh, face the British Labour Party uh, today. It certainly doesn't have its troubles or challenges to seek. Um, thank you for all your contribution. You've been listening to Patrick uh, Diamond, who is a reader in public policy at the Queen Mary University of London and held numerous roles in the Labour government in Britain prior to 2010. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your time. And thank you, everybody, for listening and goodbye. Okay, Patrick.